Hello everybody, it is Mike Levin, and today is a uh, long overdue video about where to run your code, going into a little bit of history about uh, what led me up to uh, using LXD, or now choosing LXD, the Linux container system, uh, really built into Linux, unlike Docker, which was third party, and a number of things over the years that came before it. So go into my journal this is a video the kind of video I would have normally you know shot beforehand but I'm trying to get into the habit of doing these live streams so here we go right I start a new journal entry and I know down here I have my to-do uh, list for this particular project I made it as an entry here so Let's get rid of this one. We don't really need this one. I'll just do it at the bottom of this one. Uh, this is the to-do list that I'm going to step through and showing you how to get a local um, container running on a piece of hardware, probably in your house. This is a way to run a containerized server-like thing in hardware in your house. Uh, in a cloud server location, that's a large part of the point. It doesn't really matter. Uh, in the case of what I'm about to do now, it's going to be on the uh, QNAP uh, TS251. You can see this review here was written in uh, the end of 2014, so it's quite an old piece of hardware, uh, but it's still really quite capable and I'll be upgrading it soon. I've had it sitting around for a long time and there was a massive hack that came out, the QLocker hack, uh, ransomware stuff, so I consider myself actually quite fortunate for having not set it up. And by the time I did set it up, all that information was out and I knew how to harden it and lock it down and such. But uh, before moving to this sort of solution as a, as a place to run my my software. I've been through a lot of different things. Of course, this is the infamous uh, Linksys uh, WRT router, the, the uh, genesis of the open WRT movement and really put the uh, GNU GPL public license version 2 to the test, forced uh, Linksys at the time to open source their uh, their router software and so this that made this one of the most hackable devices out there. I've also gone with more creative solutions over the years. People think that ARM is new but this is really an ARM server. This is a tiny little ARM server called the Shiva plug that work, looks just like a power adapter or a wall wart. I've got three of those. I used to run all my SEO ser server software, Pipulate. These are my Pipulate servers. Uh, those were ARM solutions. I've also gone with more traditional x86 type mini servers. This is a uh, Fit PC. That was a fun one. I ran Gen2 Linux or Gen2 if you prefer on that. And then they got smaller as these things went to ARM. And this is a formal server, whereas the Shiva plug took a little bit of hacking and you really had to be a real hardware person to understand it and to connect in through serial connections to configure it. This is the solid run little cube, and that's a little server too, full of ports in the back. You know, there's your USBs, your HDMIs. It was a nice little media server and such. And then, of course, I was the first person to unbox the Raspberry Pi online. It was my first million view video. I have the original Raspberry Pi from Element 14 back in the day, which is what the Acorn company from England that invented ARM morphed into. So you would actually buy the Raspberry Pi from the company that evolved out of the Acorn. People don't know this about ARM. So that was the original one. I also have the uh, Raspberry Pi Model B with 512 uh, megabytes of memory. I have the Raspberry Pi 2, which got up to one gigabyte of memory. You know, each of these actually has the Raspberry Pi in there. I've put them back in their cases, but I have used them over the years. And here is it, my fourth Raspberry Pi. You can see this is the one I put in the case. I think this was a, 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 a B with one gigabyte, but that's of no consequence. And that's just the real server looking devices. There were other even more creative things. This is the first tablet that had an x86 processor in it, I believe. 
and that was from Dell. It looks like a regular old tablet, but back in the days of the Google Nexus 7 and stuff, when this form factor was becoming popular, I got an x86 type one so I could try running it uh, as a little mini server. Along those lines, going back in time a bit further, this is the Asus original uh, netbook. You might recognize that. This is the thing that started the whole next uh, netbook movement. That's an Asus. And uh, let's see. There's another laptop. I love these little mini laptops. This was a Sony Bio little laptop in the days of Vista that served as a little server for a while. And uh, yeah, I guess, you know, I go through a bunch. There's more, but you get the point. And then, you know, uh, that's just uh, the hardware stuff. When I was uh, using the cloud, I, of course, uh, started out on uh, Rackspace like so many people. Uh, I moved to the Amazon AWS EC2 alphabet soup, you know, and uh, I've even done a bunch of, I don't even remember what they were called, but they were the bottom feeders, uh, the bottom feeders of, uh, you know, this is uh, cloud servers, uh, bottom feeder cloud. <laughs> probably running on people's machines in the basement in Russia and uh, and so on you know I, I didn't get to Linode and stuff but uh, I experimented with Heroku uh, you get the idea I have a fair amount of experience running my code both in uh, the cloud I was even on the Google compute cloud when it was you know uh, uh, either uh, Python which I was very pumped about or uh, Java uh, they've moved on to other cloud platform type approaches since then, uh, but I'm all, I've always been leading edge and quite bleeding edge. And there's always been problems. There's always problems, you know, running your code in a server-like way. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's, you know, running it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, without it accidentally and turning off. And there's a lot of ways for this stuff to accidentally turn off. If you're in the cloud, you know, you can, uh, if you stop paying, if you stop paying, it gets turned off. Of course, if you're running it at home and you stop paying your own personal uh, online uh, broadband bill it gets turned off too or the internet connection but you're gonna keep it running for your streaming TV and everything you know and if you're you know, other things at home if it's a Raspberry Pi or stuff uh, it gets disconnected I've even done you know um, rack based servers uh, both in co-location centers. That's how I set up Hittail when I did a web 2.0 thing and I've also done you know uh, at employers locations both rack mounted and just tower servers as servers and uh, so you know things get disconnected like Raspberry Pi in particular it's uniquely capable of getting accidentally disconnected but enough for the reasons things go wrong I've made the decision now that I'm going to LXD which is the uh, you know, formalization of both uh, Docker and LXC, which appeared first on the Linux scene, which is, you know, Linux containers. This has become uh, more indicative of the file format now, and LXD has become indicative of the uh, management uh, software that's used for it. And of course, Docker was out there too, but Docker was, was strange. It was more for application containment. And when you tried to use it as a server, you started encountering issues, particularly the way files layered up. It was really weird. I found it strange. But when LXD came along, I'm like, yeah, sign me up. So LXD uh, has an API. It's primarily a command line tool. But in the same way that I have no problem with using Jupyter Notebook and Jupyter Lab for doing Python code, I have very little problem with using the web user interface that's provided by the QNAP, my NAS, my network application server. 
So it's a piece of hardware, just to remind you, there's a piece of, ha piece of hardware in my house that looks a lot like this. I, it's an x86 you know, uh, processor in there with a couple of hard drives that are mirrored for redundancy and you know, uh, special, so special software. So this is the special software. It's like another operating system um, that's accessible through the web user interface, through the web browser. And these are my apps. And you can see here that one of the apps that I've added through their app store, you know, you can, you can, it's, I didn't have to buy it. Just, you know, they have all these different apps. These are the essentials, the recommended, and you can like surf through here and see all the different things. But this is what I'm running. And the container uh, station runs, supports both Docker and LXC. Now I've done what I'm about to show you with Docker and the same strangeness reared its ugly head. And I'm like, you know, I'm out. Uh, I'm doing LXC because I want it to look and feel and taste like any of the other servers I've ever set up in my life. You know, a, f a real operating system uh, without all that extra overhead of, I might as well point out, I also have a fair amount of experience with VMware on both the PC and VMware Fusion on the Mac and of course VirtualBox on a variety of platforms because that was another one of the ways you could do this stuff but there's so many problems with virtual machines similar stuff like for various reasons this stuff stops running so it's not the case with these containerized uh, versions of it so I'm going to open up Container Station and I'll maximize it. Nope, that was minimize. I shall maximize it. And you can see here that I actually have no images installed. I have no containers running. Con containers are derived from images. So first you get an image, and then from your image you create a, a container and you run it. And we'll just jump right into it. You go into create, and this, by the way, I'll remind you, I will be doing the API for it. You know, LXD has an API, which means a type in user interface from the command line, the timeless way of doing it, right? The API is timeless, but in the same spirit as I use Jupyter to run Python, I'll use container station to run an LXD server instance. And in the future, I'll show you the command line way of doing this in the more timeless way, because these server instances, unlike any code that's running on one of these wacky little things you may have in your life, uh, this code can be with you for the rest of your life, a server. So when you start using GitHub, your code is suddenly magically with you for your entire life. Well, now a server can be with you for your entire life. In fact, a follow-up video is going to be how to put one of these servers, one of these LXD containers, your personal one, on a GitHub repo. So you can pull your server down and have it fully running on whatever hardware you have that can host LXD images. So without further ado, you search, and in my case, I'm going to search on Ubuntu, right? Because it's going to be an Ubuntu server. It's a server that so many people are familiar with. And like I told you, I started out with Ubuntu, with Docker first, because you can see it's pushing the Docker stuff at you. See under recommended, Docker, Docker, Docker. I don't want that. I want the LXD image. So I go to the LXD image server, and there you have it, right? You've got a whole variety of images. You've got Bionic. You've got hair stew, I don't even know, all the different versions, you know, these refer to numbers. So I wish they put the numbers here, but I happen to know that Bionic is the second to latest. It's 18.04. Ubuntu is up to 20.04. And I like to be on 20.04, but 18.04 is good. And of course, the smaller, the better, because we're going to be pushing it up to GitHub eventually and having a small footprint is good. You can see this is about 100 megabytes when we start. You can tell they're working to keep it at about the 100 megabyte mark. So we'll install that. And you have a chance here to do a few things uh, before you actually create it. Uh, I don't like having these Ubuntu number systems as my name. I like, you know, naming the version it is. So this is Bionic, B-I-O-N-I-C, Bionic, right? 
and there's this little advanced option. Now there's no way you would know to do this starting out, but because I've been experimenting, I do know that this is the opportune time to set up your networking context. There are a variety of choices of networking. Well, there's NAT and bridge, right? So it's really powerful. You can uh, bridge your host machine's uh, network interface to your um, client machine host, I don't know, your image. But I'm going to use a NAT. It's a little bit safer. It's just poking a little hole. And it's going to create a whole virtual network for the container and then just network map port forward uh, the one service I'm interested in. And the one service I'm interested in is SSH. I'm going to terminal serve into this container once it's running. I will choose port 2222 for the host. And for the container, it's going to go to port 22. So any attempts to connect to port 2222 on this laptop I'm working on is actually going to be port forwarded to port 22, the traditional SSH or secure socket library port on my container. So I'll create that port. And uh, my host name, there was a chance to put a host name there. Uh, let's see. Oh, I already did that host name. Okay, so I'm creating that uh, in that container. I'm not creating it, I'm downloading it. This is actually getting downloaded off of the net right now from the LXD container directory. And there, it just sort of appeared. Image, first image, then container. So containers are derived from images. It's the image that was pulled down. And you can see there's not that many options here except for create container. Now this software, Container Station, does create the first image for you automatically. Now it's very tempting to click here and to try and log in through the terminal that comes up there, but I am going to do it through this first because I need to do, uh, I need to create a user and put it in the pseudo group, the super user do this super user group. So you can see it kind of fills in ghosted slash bin slash sh. That's the command you want to run on this machine. Connect. So it pops up a terminal in the web browser. This is a terminal in the web browser with a impossible to see hashtag there and impossible to see prompt. But you can see it is the root prompt. I will Go to 150%. Hopefully that'll be big enough for you to see what I'm about to do. But you can see what I copy and paste here as, uh, you know, the beginning stuff. I already did a bunch of these steps. Install Bionic, wait for it to appear in images, switch to containers, start Bionic, click the Run Terminal option, execute bin sh, that's what we're up to. And now we are going to add user Ubuntu. Okay. Add user Ubuntu. That's our first step. Ubuntu already exists. I even note that. That often already exists. That's a good default user uh, out of convention, a conventional first user to use instead of using uh, root, right? You're, what we're doing here is we're avoiding using root. And so my next step is going to be to user mod and add it to the pseudo group. AG add group Ubuntu. So user mod. I could just copy and paste, but I'm trying to get it into my muscle memory. This is so common of a thing. Add to group sudo, because sudo is a pre existing group on Ubuntu and many other Linux distros these days. And the user I'm adding is Ubuntu. So Ubuntu has now been added to the super user group. And now I'm going to set a password for it. Password for Ubuntu. Okay, password set successfully. I should make that maybe a little bit bigger. Set the pay. Oh, exit and close. I made it bigger just in time to close it, right? So exit. We don't need that anymore. And then you can just X out of the tab. But now that we've done that, we now have the ability to 
click this, and that will prompt us for a login here, right? You would not have been able to actually log in here. I'll make it bigger again. There's no perfect size, is there? You would have not been able to log in here had you not done that first step. So we're going to log in as user Ubuntu, and now it has a password. It doesn't have a password set by default for security reasons. And you can see we're in uh, Ubuntu at Bionic. That's a nice way to get in there. But of course, you know, I like to work in these terminals. So in fact, I'll open another one up over here. And our goal now is to get from this terminal into that little new server here. This is a running instance of Linux in a container on that QNAP NAS upstairs in my uh, workroom. So unfortunately, it's not as easy as uh, all that, but uh, it's not too difficult either. Um, remember that port forwarding uh, that I had talked about? Well, the SSH program is built into pretty much every version of uh, Unix and Linux. And if you are wondering what you're looking at here, this is the Windows subsystem for Linux version 2, WSL, WSL2. And this is the unified Microsoft terminal environment. So I can bring up terminals and shells of all different kinds. Shells are not identical. These like type in user interfaces you see, they come in different flavors and varieties from the old, you know, uh, DOS that, you know, uh, you know, has the colon backslash, the backslash, you know, convention of uh, IBM and Microsoft and uh, different mappings for Anaconda and stuff like that. But uh, we're interested in this one, which is Ubuntu at Lundervand. That's my laptop. My laptop's host name is Lundervand. And I am using that conventional Ubuntu user. Um, so I am currently Ubuntu at Lundervand on my Windows PC running Linux natively. That's the subject of a lot of videos I've produced leading up to this. But at any rate, you SSH into a uh, port of a machine you're targeting. So I'm going to uh, do port 2222 of the, uh, of the Ubuntu user at the IP of my NAS. And you might think I'm giving away something, but these 192 IPs are not accessible from the internet. That is a virtual LAN. So if everything was as easy as it would seem, I would just be able to do that and log in magically. But uh, you can see I, uh, I can't. And uh, in fact, I'm going to have to do something here that I can't really do on uh, the live streaming because that key is going to have to be deleted out of the known hosts file. So I am probably going to stop streaming for a second while I uh, do a, a tiny little modification. So just to let you know what I'm about to do, because I've done practice sessions of this in, past, in the past, the keys have changed and had this worked, it would have actually failed. In fact, I'll get up to that point and then I'll fix it at that point so that you know exactly what I'm talking about and you can see the error message. But that, um, I won't even clear that, I'll keep that showing. This attempt to log on to, uh, to this machine here uh, has failed. Connection closed by remote host. Now there's always a variety of reasons this could be Kex exchange identification. That's the that's key exchange. I don't know why they put an X in there, but uh, I I know from my experimentation uh, that I have to actually um, edit a file, edit a file, and add the line allow users Ubuntu. Right. So this is what I'm going to have to add to that file etc ssh sshd config but there's upper and lower case here and i won't have command line completion as i'm in vim so this is the one i want to copy and then i only have to go over here and in here i go vim 
And this is another advantage of using Vim over, say, VS Code. When you use Vim, you just know technology in general. Any system you're on is likely to have Vim. Uh, so I'm going to Vim etc ssh sshd underscore config. I don't think that's right. Vim etc ssh ssh config. SSH. I should be able to use command line completion and find it. Oh, oh, the leading slash. See that? See that? You have to do the leading slash, otherwise command line completion doesn't work. I'm going to hit Shift G to go to the bottom. I'm going to hit O for uh, at for new line, and then I'm going to paste in the uh, what I just copied. There's my allow users. Write. Quit. Oh, to overwrite. Aha! I got a pseudo in. So. That's a uh, Q exclamation point. Clear that so it's not as confusing to look at. I need to sudo vim etc ssh ssh config, right? That's more like it. Shift G, O, paste, escape, A. That does not look correct. Web terminals, man. But it doesn't look like my thing is at the bottom of that like I had thought. So I am in insert mode. It just looks weird here. I'm going to um, open that to a larger console because that's so hard to see. I'm going to quit out of Vim, forcibly quit it with a colon Q exclamation point, clear, make it a little bit bigger, right? And now I will try once more, sudo vim etc ssh slash ssh config. Well, it is there. It is there. I don't know why these other ones look so bold in here, and my line looks... Uh, not bold. It's like markdown or something weird. But I got the line in, and that should be enough. Um, yeah, that should be enough. Ah, same error. We have to maybe restart the SSH server. Okay, so service. If you just type service, it's going to show you the different things. This is a higher level uh, uh, API interface uh, to things that people might be uh, uh, more familiar with. Like uh, there's an init.d under one way of doing it. There's a uh, system CTL, something like that, control. There's a whole bunch of different commands for stopping and starting services under Linux based on your distro. But if you use this service command, it works across any Linux distro that uses this higher level abstraction. So you can see what services are running by service, status all, and here's all my services. Oh, well, there is no SSH on here. There I go skipping steps, right? So. Uh, it's funny that there was a uh, SSH config there when there was no SSH. That was from my experimentation before. So here we go. We're going to install uh, SSH. I believe I had uh, that in my config, yeah, in my uh, instructions here. So I, I indeed did. So before installing anything, it's always a good idea to sudo apt update. This makes sure that your local directory of all the software you can install is up to date, particularly important when you just uh, create a new 
uh, instance of a machine from an image because you don't know how up to date that image is. So sudo uh, apt update. It doesn't look like there's anything to upgrade, but maybe. All packages are up to date. That's great. So we can do sudo apt install ss. Uh, it's open ssh open ssh hyphen server. And you can see as we scroll up, there's no SSH. It's before and after. There's no SSH service running. These are the services that are available, and the plus sign is the services that are enabled, right? So our goal is to get one in here that says SSH. And it's a pretty, pretty friggin' big install. You'll see that the size of this image under the uh, NAS uh, grows from a hundred megabytes of the original image to you know uh, 300 or so you know this adds a few hundred more megabytes of stuff look at all this python stuff that's going on okay so an, an, an ssh server is installed open ssh we can look at our services again and there is ssh and it is in fact running and I did that step of adding Ubuntu to the uh, allowed users. So we give it another test. And here is our, our warning. This is because I have been playing around with this before. And, uh, you know, in the sake of, uh, for the sake of making this video work, I am going to do it while we're connected. I'm just going to grow so big here that you're not going to be able to see the full keys cd uh, home directory it's always in your home directory dot ssh this is where some important files on your system are kept your uh, your keys for connecting to remote servers through key exchanges uh, you have created your own locally these get created through uh, ssh keygen that's another story but i need to delete the last line off of known hosts so excuse me while I go ridiculously large and go vim, vim, known hosts. And I'm going to delete the last line, which I happen to know is the one that uh, is causing the problem. And I'll zoom back down. And now we attempt to log in again to that uh, new containerized LXD server image we just created. And the key exchange begins, right? Do you want to uh, trust it? Are you sure it's uh, who you think it is? Yes. And we give our password. And here we are logged in to that server. See, Ubuntu at Bionic, right? This is now a place to run code. This is an actual file that's sitting on the hard drive that's easy to back up, that's easy to put in a GitHub repo, that's easy to put on a thumb drive that can be with you for the rest of your life. And it's a very generic Ubuntu server. It's a unit of computing. And even as things change, you can just reinstall on a new container image in the future if you wanted to freshen up your container images. But until you need to change uh, Ubuntu versions or something, this is just a completely nomadic portable version. Oh, I was telling you how much I was into this. If you Google Linux, you'll see I've even released a version of uh, a version of Linux on my own that solves this exact problem. And it looks like that. It's uh, solved this problem in the long, long ago before there were so many other good solutions to do it. So that's how serious I am about this. I create my own versions of Linux to, uh, and it's still actually quite interesting. Uh, you should check out Linux, uh, a way to move your code around nomadic instances of, of Linux. We don't need this anymore. This is the uh, browser-based uh, terminal, so we can get out of that. And then I'll show you maybe some other interesting stuff here in the uh, Echidna. Uh, Echidna, that's... So I have <laughs> play on words. I had to name my NAS. And, um, you know, it's called a NAS. And uh, 
I had to choose a name for it. So I have the echidnas, echidnas. So anyone into animals might appreciate that. These terminals, you know, are running on a remote machine. So there's really no damage or danger in clicking away from it. If you ever clicked back on it and you're like, oh, I lost my terminal, you can just open it right back up and there you are exactly uh, the way you were before. Uh, but the, uh, the size of this, that's the image, right? So you, you, the image is what things are derived from. So it's a cookie cutter, it's a template. You can create container after container from this image. Now, if we go to the container, this is actually running. Uh, you can just go over to running and you can see it's running. And uh, you can't really see the size of it here. I would like to show you some other stuff about how portable it is, but that's that's basically it. You know, uh, you can do stuff here. You can install web servers. In fact, the whole point is you would grab a container or a Docker. Oh, there it is. It's starting to update. It's still a hundred, only 105 megabytes. That can't be correct after the uh, SSH server install. You'll probably see this dynamically adapt to some. Uh, Oh, that's upload and download bytes per second. It's not the size of the server. Let's see what we have. We can stop it. We can restart it. We can open a terminal command. That's different. See, this is ex executing a command directly on the server uh, without an SSH terminal, whereas this is opening an SSH terminal. And all this web user interface uh, way of doing this is really just an alternative to, again, I remind you, the type in API for the LXD server, which is a better way to inter interact with containers and LXD in particular, because it is timeless, because it's timeless. Okay, so anyway, what more can I show you there? It looks kind of boring getting to this point, but you know, if we exit out of that, you can see my prompt goes back to my uh, VENV, virtual, different kind of virtualization. These, you know, um, this shows me that I have my Python 3.8, you know, uh, virtual ENV active, but nonetheless, it's my Linux prompt that shows me my username at my host name and the directory I'm in. And uh, that's different than when I terminal serve into, I still say terminal serve, when SSH, this is a secure shell. So there's my prompt for my uh, container. There you have it. That's, uh, that's the video. Um, this is the best place to run your code now because of how quick it is to do all this stuff. Look, if I were to stop the server. This is stopping the container, and this is now running it. This is, you can see if connection lost. If I were to try to connect to it, not there, okay? But this is how fast it instantiates. This is completely different than things like virtual machines, right? This is so much better than a virtual machine. Fast, memory efficient, uh, if we looked at the memory profile that was going on here, um, this machine, this this um, this NAS doesn't have a lot of memory in the first place. Sufficient memory, it's saying. But if we click that guy, we can get a little idea of the resources that are going here. So Container Station is using uh, 262 uh, megabytes, and that's with a whole instance of a Ubuntu server running, you know, I, I can't explain how awesome and how much of a game changer this is now to have a server that has the same robustness, ability to keep running, uh, nomadic nature, ability to run on different host hardware, uh, small size, uh, the list goes on. LXD is just so much better than Docker, so much better than all these different ver VMware props for my use. I mean, there's different, there's different uses, uh, you know, different needs for different people. But for my need as a casual developer who likes to, you know, 
have things improving over time, the never ending improving process, uh, LXD really does the job better than anything else. So uh, thanks for joining me. Joining me. Hope to see you again soon. And don't forget